appreciate that. Okay, can uh, people on Zoom see the presentation now? Good, yes, I have a thumbs up. All right, so um, as defined by people working in the field, intimate partner violence is violence or abuse between people who are or previously have been intimate partners, so slightly circular. Uh, intimate, but if we then define intimate partner uh, and violence, uh, we can sort of unravel that circularity a bit. So an intimate partner is a spouse, a dating partner, boyfriend, girlfriend, or ongoing sexual partner. And the violence can take different forms. So we're not just limited to fix, physical or sexual abuse, but also can be psychological or emotional, mental abuse. Um, and these are important uh, because uh, the intimate partner violence is, in, is associated with negative health outcomes, uh, injuries uh, from physical violence, stress-related disorders, depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation and attempts, unwanted pregnancy, unsafe abortions, and sexually transmitted diseases. So this is why uh, it's, a, it's a component in various instruments to assess social determinants of health. Uh, so according to the WHO, so, uh, maybe we've seen this definition from the WHO already, uh, social determinants of health are the non-medical factors that influence health outcomes and include the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age, and the wider set or sets of forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life. So we've been working uh, in the context of two instruments specifically. So PREPARE that was mentioned by Melissa and uh, EPIC has a module, the EPIC electronic health record has a module called Healthy Planet. And Healthy Planet includes a number of social determinants of health related items in it. So PREPARE has two questions uh, under a heading of safety and domestic violence. Question one, do you feel physically and emotionally safe where you currently live? Yes, no, or unsure, or I choose not to answer. And then question two, in the past year, have you been afraid of your partner or ex-partner? Yes, no, unsure, I have not had a partner in the last year, or I choose not to answer the question. In Healthy Planet, uh, there's four items or questions under the heading of intimate partner violence. Uh, one is pretty much equivalent to prepare, but the uh, response set is different. So within the past year, have you been afraid of your partner or ex-partner? Yes, no, or patient refused. And the reason it says patient refused, I believe, is there's different modes in which you can ask these questions. So one mode is a facilitated mode where the interviewer is asking the questions and recording the responses in real time. Uh, the, the other mode you can imagine is the patient's just working on the device themselves, entering their own answers by themselves. Uh, the other three questions in EPIC are the following. Uh, one's about, have you been humiliated or emotionally abused? Have you been kicked, hit, slapped, or otherwise physically hurt? And the third question is, within the last year, have you been raped or forced to have any kind of sexual activity by your partner or ex-partner? And all three of those questions have the same response set as the first question, yes, no, and patient refused. So uh, we take uh, our overall approach is um, a referent tracking approach, which is given a response by a particular patient to a particular question at a particular time, what has to be true? What has to exist in reality? And in what relationships do those things exist in order for that to be a true statement? So that's uh, the, the, the framework we're working in and, and, and how the results are gonna follow. Um, and, and there's temporal intervals evolved. Um, and so we're basically connecting a lot of the processes to the patient's history. So history in BFO is def defined as basically all the, pro roughly, <laughs> um, I don't have the definition up here, but the, the sum of all processes in which that continuum is. Up. Participant, yes, that is the actual BFO definition. Um, so for question one, the reference of a yes or no uh, response include um, whether you answer yes or no, it's talking about where you live. And so in OMERS, um, is, which is how we pronounce that acronym, although Chris Mungle helpfully suggested we should pronounce it, oh mercy, 
because uh, working in this area can be difficult sometimes. Did I just kick that off? Yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, we had this class already disclosure of residence, um, a process that outputs a person's address uh, and includes their residence zip code, information content entity, which is about some geographical region. Um, three questions ask about a feeling or judgment of safety. Uh, so we uh, are reusing the emotion ontology here, uh, has a class appraisal of dangerousness, and it has several subclasses to appraisal of dangerousness. So if yes, uh, if the answer is yes, then there is an instance of appraisal as dangerous. Or, it, oh, if you feel safe, then there does not exist an instance of, of, of appraisal as not dangerous. Apologies. If you feel safe, then you have an instance of appraisal as not dangerous. If you answer no, you have an instance of appraisal as dangerous. Uh, both cases, you have an appraisal. Um, and then questions two or three, if you've been afraid of your partner or ex-partner, uh, if yes, then the appraisal as dangerous is about that partner or the ex-partner. Um, we just note that the emotion ontology and uh, mental functioning ontology, uh, the concretizations of information uh, are called representations, and those have the aboutness relation, not the information content entity itself. It's a nuance, I don't want to debate it, but just FYI, because they did that, we followed. Um, and if you're interested in the distinction and the nuance, there's a uh, paper from 2015, which I believe is an ICBO paper. Uh, and so appraisal of dangerousness is a subclass of representation. And so here we're drawing the particulars for a particular patient giving a particular response at a particular time. So every circle represents an instance, not a class. Uh, the respondent is the person, is the patient, right? Instance of homo sapiens, presumably, or human being. And in hearing in that person is an instance of appraisal is dangerous. It's a representation or a specifically dependent continuum. And the person has, uh, has history relationship to the history, which is a process. And that has a proper occurrence part, the process of disclosing the residence, which is the output, the resident zip code, which is about the geographical region where the person lives. The appraisal of dangerousness is about where you live also. And, um, you know, obviously the, the disclosure of resident is participated in by the person who's disclosing their residence. Uh, so for five questions, uh, the answer yes implies that there is or was an intimate partnership, relationship. So we used BFO's relational quality as a parent of intimate par partnership and defined it as a relational quality and in, in hearing in persons by virtue of being each other's spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, dating partner, or ongoing sexual partner, according to the WHO um, text from before. So this just shows the partner or ex-partner of the respondent. Uh, they're at opposite corners here. Intimate partnership is in hearing in both of them. Um, this intimate partnership is a process that's part of their history. And um, the appraisal is dangerous is about the ex-partner here. Um, each of the three remaining questions ask about different types of abuse. So drawing upon the American Psychiatric or American Psychological Association's Dictionary of Psychology, definition of abuse and using go behavior as a parent class, which is a little bit of a touchy subject. Um, abusive behavior is defined as behavior that is cruel, violent, demeaning, or invasive. And so we introduced object properties to connect the abuse to each of the aggressor and the abuse so we can differentiate who's the abuser and who's the abusee, who's being abused. So has aggressor is the relationship between the abusive behavior and the partner or in, who's committing the violence and is abuse of connects the abusive behavior to the victim. 
Um, then we use CDC definitions for subclasses of abusive behavior. So there's psychologically abusive behavior. So the aggressor does or attempts to do the following mentally or emotionally harm or exert control. Uh, we have more to say about does or attempts to do if I have time. Um, physically abusive and sexually abusive and the de definitions are there. Um, and so we distinguish the three types of abusive behavior. So um, it just occurs to me maybe sexually abusive is a subclass of physically abusive, but uh, I, we may do that, I, I don't remember. Um, we say does or attempts to do because both successful and failed attempts to count for abuse. So if the aggressor attempts to hit someone, it doesn't matter that they missed, um, it, it's, it's bad, right? It counts. So now we can represent the situation implied by a yes uh, answer in the same way. So it's all the same for the next three questions, but then the instance of abuse will be an instance of one of those three classes, physical, psychological, or sexual. Uh, here's the diagram again. The key points here is we again have the patient in the top right and their ex-partner in the bottom, top left and bottom right, sorry, their intimate relationship. Um, and then part of their history is um, the abuse here. And it's his abuse of the respondent and has aggressor, the ex-partner. And it occupies a region that's part of their temporal region that the history occupies. So uh, each diagram represents only the reference of a single response. You can imagine we're gonna ask these patients these questions again, probably. We, we're not gonna just ask once. Um, and so as you ask people again and again, and you ask multiple people, then the representations are gonna build and grow and be linked. Uh, so if we ask them again in a month, we don't wanna re-represent their ex-partner. We wanna reuse the representation of the expert partner that we used uh, previously. So that's it. Thank you. Take five minutes. Yeah, so Robert, I saw you pop up your hand first. That'd be a very nice question. I have a quick question. Why does only sexual abuse involve consent and none of the other ones? And why is it not part of your own the consent? Because I could mention that also physical harm is a client that the process can also have a consensual in case it is not the uh but it is that by so the question is, um, why does the issue of consent only appear in the definition of sexual abuse and not um, other classes? And it, it's a good question and we should take it into account and um, think through whether we should modify based on that. I think you make a reasonable argument. I think it's a good argument. I'm wondering and I haven't looked in it enough. Maybe this is a hint that those two classes are not subclasses, but that they are really on the same level. Because the question would then be: um, Would I think the cases uh, which um, Robert had in mind would those things still feel under sexual behavior? So maybe this is the situation because of where you say um, that uh, sexual abuse covers all kinds of sexual behavior, but they are that the consent is and I'm. All right, so I know a number of people have hands up, so I'll go here. Uh, sorry, I don't know your name. So um, I was asked to go back to the first slide where we talk about or sort of definition, attempt definitions of intimate partner violence. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Other questions? So, um, is it Gunder? Gun um, so, I'm wondering, so you mentioned you kind of I guess the right thing to uh, on the side. So, the top says uh, maybe we have two things. So, how do we, or if they want to say one thing, that was sexual violence. What is the case? 
information that they wouldn't have in the used cases. Some people call it the utility scheme. Put on the same level where there's a hierarchy. So the question was, um, does it make a difference to our use cases uh, whether sexual abuse is a subclass of physical abuse or a sibling class? Um, immediately right here and now standing on my feet talking to you all, I can't think of a, a reason it would matter. Um, uh, and the suggestion is it might have a legal implication um yeah that wasn't our use case but it's a good one it, it's a good use case nonetheless and one that we should ultimately will need to take into account so yeah no that's a great point and we'll certainly think about it so if i still have time jonathan you're next whoops sorry i went too fast This one? Yes. Yes. The question was whether in this diagram, is there one instance of intimate partnership that inheres in both the respondent and the ex or slash partner? The answer is yes. How would we model if it if it were a partner that involved more than two people? A uh, part of the answer depends on relational quality, if that can inhere in multiple, more than two, uh, independent continuance, then I think we'd be okay. If it's restricted to two independent continuance, we might have a problem. My gut though, um, is that it's not restricted to two. And then we would just have a third entity. You know, it, it, it obviously uh, we're kind of working in um, binary relation restriction mode. So the intimate partnership would then just have another and here's into a third person. Okay, I think we're gonna have to move on. Okay.